Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. Despise not prophesyings. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Nabil Qureshi was a medical doctor who converted from Islam to Christianity. He wrote a book about his journey to finding Jesus and ministered around the world. In 2016, at the age of 33, he was diagnosed with stage 4 stomach cancer. He began to pray that God would heal him, but was soon told he shouldn't simply hope for a miracle, but expect one, because the church still has apostles, and it's always God's will to heal. Nabil believed. God, I believe, um, is doing a healing work in me. It's, it's my belief. Um, after studying the scriptures, after receiving tons of prophecy, and of course after my last scan where 80% of the cancer in my body uh, is gone. Nabil met with numerous faith healers and went to Bethel Church in Redding, California. Hands were laid on him and prayers of faith offered, but in spite of a multitude of prophecies that he would be healed, the cancer didn't go away. Nevertheless, Nabil didn't stop expecting a miracle. I believe in a God who is able to raise even the dead, not just on the last day. Yes, on the last day, he will raise us. I'm not denying that. But the scriptural example we have here is of a God who raises people even when they die before the last day. And if we're to have hope in this God, we cannot give up. Even when our first line treatment fails, even when it looks like, yeah, medically speaking, there's no option. We keep hoping. That's the example I have in Scripture. Now you, if you want to, can come up with some reason to explain away Scripture and to say, no, that doesn't apply for us today. I see no reason to do that mutilation to Scripture. Our God heals even today. I know it. I have friends who have prayed over people and have raised them from the dead. Just over four months after making this video, Nabil was dead. His wife continued to pray, but he wasn't raised up again. Dr. Michael Brown responded. My assumption is there's nothing that Nabil did in himself to bring on this terrible condition. He was uh, stricken with it, and therefore the first response, the natural response, is to ask for healing. And I believe that if, if he had been in the crowds that were around Jesus and, and whoever touched him was healed, that he would have been among those that, that were healed. And it was a sign of God's compassion and love. And, uh, and we should expect this in an ongoing way today and gifts of healing in the body and the prayer offered in faith, making the sick person well. I, I believe in that. That's one. Two, I know that some of the places mentioned like Bethel have a steady stream of miraculous testimonies. The miraculous healings at Bethel, to which Dr. Brown refers, are taking place under Pastor Bill Johnson, who claims the gifts of the biblical apostles. He says that those who believe that it is ever God's will that someone be sick are preaching another gospel. And so this ministry of Jesus that dealt with every single person that came to him with affliction or torment, he ministered to them. That's the only standard to follow. I refuse to create a theology that allows for sickness. Paul refers to his thorn in the flesh, which has been interpreted by many as disease allowed or brought on by God. That's a different gospel. Jesus didn't model it and he didn't teach it. In late 2019, tragedy struck Bethel Church. Saturday, just a few days ago, we had a great tragedy. One of the key individuals in our world, uh, their two-year-old little girl died quite unexpectedly, just out of nowhere. And so we've been uh, praying for the miracle of God. Mom and Dad, Andrew and Callie, have asked us to pray for resurrection. We've joined with them. We have a biblical precedent. Jesus raised the dead. Jesus raised the dead. 
Not only that, he introduced himself as the resurrection and the life. In fact, in John 11, verse 40, he says, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. And so seeing what Jesus has accomplished, what he did in his lifetime, and then when you add to that, that he commanded his followers, his disciples, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out devils, to cleanse lepers. None of those are things that we can actually do. And yet he commanded us because somehow in our yes, he gives us the ability to carry out his mission. For days, the church prayed for Allah's resurrection. Just as with Nabil, Allah's resurrection never came. But many insist the dead are being raised today. But here's first what I see for, for TBN. You're going to have people raised from the dead watching this network. You're going to have people raised from the dead watching TBN. I'm telling you, I see this in the spirit. It's going to be so awesome. Hey, I was in Ghana just recently. We had half a million people show up. And a man was raised from the dead on the platform. That's a fact, people. I, that's a fact. A man was raised from the dead on the platform. We have it on video. Not only was no one raised from the dead through TBN, but apparently the video of the resurrection in Ghana was lost. We don't doubt that God still heals. But where is the evidence that modern faith healers have the gifts of the apostles and that it's always God's will to heal? Dr. Richard Kastorf was an internist and cardiologist with an MD and a PhD. He was an assistant professor of medicine at the University of California at Irvine. He reviewed 10 cases of supposed miracles by faith healers, eight of which were connected with the work of his friend, Catherine Kuhlman. In 1976, he wrote a book on the subject, giving his opinion that these people had been healed by the power of the Holy Spirit. The book was a response to one written two years earlier by Dr. William Nolan. He had reviewed other cases of supposed healings by Catherine Kuhlman. Though some symptoms had been lessened, he found no healing of the underlying conditions. Dr. Nolan recounts the story of a woman he calls Helen Sullivan. At the service, as soon as she said someone with cancer is being cured, I knew she meant me. I could just feel this burning sensation all over my body, and I was convinced the Holy Spirit was at work. I went right up on stage, and when she asked me about the brace, I just took it off, though I hadn't had it off for over four months. I had so much back pain. While I was up on stage, bending over, touching my toes, running up and down as she asked me to, I felt just wonderful. I didn't have a pain anywhere. Mrs. Sullivan describes going to bed happier than she had been in years but waking up at 4 a.m. to horrific pain. X-rays reveal that she had not been healed and that one of her vertebrae had collapsed. She died four months later of the cancer from which she was supposedly healed. Some of the supposed miracles Dr. Castorf reported were striking, but others not so much. One of his ten was the healing of Paul Trousdale. Craig Keener would later include it in his two-volume work on miracles, as a well-documented healing of a well-known businessman. Mr. Trousdale had unexplained internal hemorrhaging. It stopped as suddenly as it appeared after the prayer of Pastor John Hinkle. Tests afterwards found nothing wrong with Mr. Trousdale, but the doctors weren't clear what was wrong in the first place. Pastor Hinkle was a minister with the Unity School of Christianity, which denies the deity of Jesus and the personality of the Holy Spirit. He would also later claim on TBN that God had told him he would rip the evil out of this world on June 9, 1994. One of the more striking cases Dr. Castorf reported was Lisa Varios, but it's unclear whether she actually had cancer or merely an infection. She credited her healing not just to Kuhlman, but to a vision of the Virgin Mary. Dr. Castorf would claim miracles were also taking place at the Catholic Shrine of Medjugorje, 
George Bernard Shaw observes something at the older Catholic shrine of Lourdes that also describes Medjugorje and the modern faith healers. All those canes, braces, and crutches, and not a single glass eye, wooden leg, or toupee. The Catholic Church recognizes 67 miracles at Lourdes since 1858. Some are hard to explain, but when they're compared to the millions who visit each year, they're not statistically different from those who go into spontaneous remission of their conditions without supposed miracles. Atheists point to the ineffectiveness of faith healers to call into question the resurrections and healings recorded in the Bible. I've been through so much on writing that book, The Faith Eaters. It really hurt a great deal having to be interviewing people who had suffered so greatly at the hands of the faith eaters. And what can we do about it? What can politicians do about it? What can, as I said earlier, federal and municipal authorities do about it? They don't want to do anything about it because you're questioning God. And you can't question God because God works in mysterious ways. James Randi was a professional magician who in 1986 exposed the faith healer Peter Popoff. He describes his assistant. He came back to me rather excited and he said, he's got a hearing aid in his left ear. And I said, Popoff himself? And he said, yeah. So I thought to myself, self? <laughs> a man who heals the deaf. <laughs> He's wearing a hearing aid? I suspect something is, uh, is not quite right here. Randy revealed that what were supposed to be revelations from God were coming from Popoff's wife over a radio earpiece. In the name of Jesus. Jody Dean. Jody Dean. Is it Jody? Jody? Dean? Dean? Jody Dean? No, she should be right there on your right side. Here it comes. Okay, she moves at 4267 Masterson. 4267 Masterson. I can see the angels of God all around your house. Rosa? Kamir. Is it Kamir? You've been taking a lot of medication. She's there with her son, Kipper. He has a lump in his chest. Wait just a minute. Who's Kipper? He's got a lump in his chest. You want God to melt it right now? Kipper, stand up. God's going to burn that thing out right now. Despite the evidence, many continue to insist that they were healed through Popoff. Similar tricks have been played over and over. I, whenever you see them do this on YouTube, there's always a point. They bring the legs up, and then they ask for the camera to come in. And all that's happening at that point is they just loosen one shoe. Not the shoe we're all looking at, but the other shoe. All the trick is going to be is, while we're talking about this, this leg lengthening, I'm just moving this shoe, just sliding it back on, the, back on the heel. It's a very old, classic faith healer trick. This kid's job, he had a pair of very worn crutches, and his job was to run up the aisle on his crutches like this. He wasn't crippled, not crippled at all. This was his job. And to walk up there and say, save me, Reverend Roberts. And they would go down and they would pick him up and put him on the stage. And he had learned to cry. He actually learned for his part, he learned how to cry. And Earl Roberts would go over to him and heal him. And then he would throw away the crutches, run down the stairs, down the aisle, out the back of the uh, tent, and hide in the truck. That's where he slept, and they take him to the next place. That was his job. He also served lunch to the truck drivers and whatnot, but uh, that was his main job, was to act as a cripple for R.L. Roberts. Testimonials and apparent miracles prepare a people who desperately want one for themselves. What's not so obvious is what happens to those who never make it onto the stage. He and his parents were the people who were asked to stand behind a big rope that they had across the back of the auditorium. That's what Popoff did and uh, still does, and most of the faith eaters have done this. Uh, Earl Roberts and all the rest of them did this. Stand them back there because these are people who won't improve at all and that nothing can be done for. And we looked through the whole show and we saw that he never got up anywhere near the front and then they left, and we were packing up the van afterwards. I'm sorry, this is difficult. 
And the kid came walking over to pass by us, and his parents were behind him, weeping copiously. The father saw me, and he took me aside, and he said, and the, the cameraman rushed over, and he said, we've been to five of his healing services now, and he always puts us behind the rope. And we drove 800 miles today to be at this service. For years, James Randi offered $1 million to anyone who could demonstrate a supernatural healing. No one ever claimed the prize. For all their differences, there's one thing on which atheists like Randy and the faith healers are agreed. They want you to believe that you can't reject the faith healers without rejecting Jesus. But he and his apostles needed no rope to keep people back. They miraculously healed all who came to them, and in ways the modern faith healers can't begin to replicate. The question we really need to ask is where we got these modern apostles. Many charismatics are familiar with the more recent history of the movement, and maybe even some of the older history. But few are familiar with the facts surrounding the man who claimed to be the first apostle since biblical times. John Alexander Dowie was a faith healer in late 19th century Australia. There's a plague in Australia. People are dying. And Christians are just basically saying, Lord, your will be done. When Dowie gets gripped with the reality after yet another funeral for yet another young person or family member or friend, whatever, he gets gripped with the reality of Acts 10.38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. He suddenly thinks of Luke 13. Here's a woman who's crippled by a spirit for 18 years. Satan has crippled her. And he realized this disease, this plague, it's not from above, it's from below. And when he takes hold of divine authority and rebukes it, suddenly it stops. People are healed left and right. The thing turns. And he discovered that there was a lot of church tradition that was not accurate. He would later form a doctrine that would be a part of the early Pentecostal movement called Don't Trust Your Doctors, Throw Out Your Medicine, and Trust God Only. And that's where this doctrine came from. Follow-up showed many lost their supposed healing within hours or days. Now he said it was because of their lack of faith. Like broken cisterns, they simply couldn't hold the blessing they'd received. Investigators found a man who insisted he had truly been healed of his blindness but his daughter said he could see no better after the healing than before. Dowie claimed such reports were lies, and part of the persecution he endured from pastors and newspaper reporters. He denounced them as dirty yellow dogs, rats, and pigs. In 1888, he left Australia for California. There, his teachings resulted in a number of deaths, especially of children, but many remain convinced he really was a divine healer. By 1893, Dowie had relocated to Chicago. There he set up the Zion Tabernacle, outside the entrance to the Columbian Exposition. The 27 million visitors gave him a ready audience, and his popularity soared. On January 22, 1896, he announced the formation of what would become the Catholic Christian Apostolic Church in Zion. He said the churches of his day had gone in the way of Baal, and the purpose of Zion was to smash every other church in existence. He prophesied even the Pope would join his church. By 1899, he determined that he was the prophet Elijah promised in Malachi, sent to prepare the world for the second coming. Part of that preparation was the building of the city of Zion, 40 miles north of Chicago. Dowie would own all the land, but residents could lease a lot for 1,100 years on which they could build a house so long as they abstain from tobacco, liquor, medicine, and pork. He started the Bank of Zion and Zion Lace Industries. Investors could buy shares from which they might enjoy a portion of the profits, but Dowie would own everything. By 1902, Zion had a population of 6,000, and Dowie claimed 150,000 followers. On September 18, 1904, he consecrated himself the first apostle since biblical times. All of this is strangely reminiscent of what Joseph Smith had done a generation earlier, 
He also claimed God was restoring prophets and apostles for the second coming. And like Dowie, he said he was issuing the midnight cry and restoring the one true church to the earth for the last generation. He said that church had gifts of miracles, along with tongues and healing of the sick and visions. Smith's followers, like Dowie's, insisted they could drink poison without harm and raise the dead. And like Dowie, Smith built a town in Illinois where his followers could gather to escape the judgments, which he said were about to engulf America. He also started a bank and gave Dowie the example of selling lots to his followers at highly inflated prices. Both men denounced pastors for taking a salary, but both were supported in luxury by their churches, with Dowie enjoying a grand collection of homes. Both men agreed the regathering of Israel was necessary for the second coming, but they differed on who Israel really was. For Smith, the American Indians were the lost tribes of Israel. For Dowie, it was the Anglo-Saxons. The Saxons were supposed to be Isaac's sons. He said the tribe of Dan had become the modern Danes. Though Smith's movement flourished more after his death, Dowie was much more popular during his lifetime and was declared the richest man in the West. Both Smith and Dowie insisted they were being persecuted when pastors answered their accusations of apostasy and criticized their supposed miracles. One example was Lydia Markley, who appeared on the cover of Dowie's magazine as a remarkable story of healing. She was convinced she had been healed of partial paralysis. But those who saw her recognized she continued to walk only with the greatest of difficulty. In 1902, Dowie's 23-year-old daughter suffered severe burns. The man who said it was a sin to call a doctor called one for his daughter. But neither Dowie nor the doctor could heal her, nor raise her from the dead. The next year, Dowie led a massive mission into New York City. Eight trains carried 3,000 followers on a work he assured them would turn the world upside down. Despite spending massive amounts of money, and packing Madison Square Garden, only 125 members were added. The magic was fading for Dowie. Supposed miracles had a hard time offsetting the growing list of those who refused medicine and died. His daughter was dead. His brother-in-law was suing him for fraud. He had been unable to do anything to stop smallpox from ravaging Zion. His prophecies were failing, and then in 1905, he had a stroke that left him with a distinct limp that never went away. For some, a faith healer who couldn't be healed didn't worry them, but others were having second thoughts. As the money slowed, it became apparent that Dowie had embezzled over two and a half million dollars from the church. There were also reports from many, including his wife and son, that he had secretly been promoting and practicing polygamy, as well as teaching like Joseph Smith before him, that the father of Jesus was a fleshly man. The revelations made sense of Dowie sending missionaries to Utah two years earlier to convince the Mormons to embrace him as their prophet. The Mormons had been forced to officially abandon polygamy in 1890 after many of their leaders had been in prison. Unofficially, many continued to practice it, but renewed federal scrutiny in 1903 was forcing the current Mormon prophet to crack down. Dowie was offering a 700,000-acre colony in Mexico, where he would return Mormons to the teachings of Joseph Smith, with him as their new prophet. Before he could complete his plans, he was removed from office, disfellowshipped, and died two years later at the age of 59. In spite of all this, Dowie isn't remembered by charismatics as a false prophet or con man like Smith. And John Dowie shook America. How many of you have never heard his name? How many have? Well, it's an amazing ministry that he had, a mighty miracle ministry. Dowie's history is rewritten and sanitized because he can't be separated from the history of Pentecostalism. Dowie's effect on Pentecostalism, especially the healing side of it, is phenomenal. He helped train all of us, and to be honest with you, the doctrines he preached on healing we preach today. He trained 150 people that became pioneers of the Pentecostal movement. So Dowie has an effect 
on this great Pentecostal that we're a part of today, and we owe him thanks. Charles Parham, the official father of Pentecostalism, went to Zion, Illinois in 1900. He went back in 1906, calling Dowie a true prophet and telling the people of Zion to reject the new leadership in favor of his own. But before we look at Parham, we need to look briefly at his teacher, Frank Sanford. Most Pentecostal histories report that after praying all through New Year's Eve, Agnes Osmond was the first person to speak in tongues since the days of the Apostles on January 1, 1901. She was a student at Charles Parham's Bethel Bible College in Topeka, Kansas. What's seldom told is that the same thing had happened exactly a year earlier at the Bible School of the Holy Ghost and Us Society in Shiloh, Maine. After fasting and praying through New Year's Eve, it was said that the Holy Spirit was poured out in a new Pentecost, which included both prophecy and speaking in tongues. The school's founder, Frank Sanford, came to Topeka later that year and took Parham back to Shiloh, where he stayed for six weeks. One of the things that drew Parham there was the report that Olive Mills had been raised from the dead. He saw it as evidence that the apostolic gifts had been returned to the church. The reason Bethel in 1901 is given as the birthplace of the modern Pentecostal movement, rather than Shiloh the previous year, is what happened afterwards. In the early years of his ministry, Sanford saw himself as part of a larger outpouring of the Spirit that would precede the Second Coming. He applauded Dowie's purported healings. He agreed that the Anglo-Saxons were the lost tribes of Israel and flew an American flag and a Union Jack from the two turrets of his school. They were meant to represent the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. But in 1901, Sanford declared that he was the new Elijah, not Dowie. He claimed that God had called him to restore his one true church to the earth and given him the sole authority to baptize. That baptism was to be done in Jesus' name alone, a position Purim would also embrace. A.J. Tomlinson, who would become the first overseer of the Church of God, was baptized into Sanford's church in 1901. By 1904, 600 people had taken up residence at Shiloh and given it everything they owned to model the church in the aftermath of Pentecost. Sanford said God directly addressed him with the words of the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Extreme fastings led to numerous outbreaks of disease, Sanford insisted this demonstrated a lack of faith. In 1904, his refusal to give medicine, food, and even water to 14-year-old Leander Bartlett when he had diphtheria led to Sanford's conviction for manslaughter, though the conviction was later overturned. In 1909, he declared Jesus would return on September 15th of that year, 30 seconds after 10.20 a.m. The time came and went but the prophet soon announced that God had called the society to establish a mission in Africa before the end. Their two ships arrived off the coast of Gambia on April 4, 1911. A smallpox outbreak there convinced Sanford they weren't actually going to set up the mission, but rather pray as they sailed around Africa. The larger of their ships was soon destroyed in a storm, so everyone crowded on the one remaining ship, which was now at double its capacity. Sanford blamed the people's lack of faith for their troubles and lack of provisions. After giving up on their sail around Africa, they managed to limp back to the United States. But before a boat could return with supplies, Sanford received a new revelation that they couldn't wait, but must leave immediately for Greenland to set up a mission station there. Even though they were already starving and some had died, he assured them God would provide. They sailed past numerous ports where they could have resupplied, but Sanford said they needed to press on and trust God. Battling storms for weeks, their sails tattered, hull leaking, and people near death, the people pressed Sanford to turn back to Maine. He finally agreed, but promised the wrath of God would come upon them. By the time they got back, the crew was dead or dying from starvation, with one exception. Sanford had continued to eat well throughout the voyage. He would be convicted again for manslaughter 
and this time served seven years of a ten-year sentence in the federal penitentiary in Atlanta. Like Dowie, Sanford has largely been written out of Pentecostal and charismatic histories, but their histories are not that different from the father of Pentecostalism. Charles Fox Parham went back to Topeka, and now known as the Shiloh Apostle, started his own Bible college in October 1900. He told his students to meditate on Acts chapter 2 as to what might be the sign of being filled with the Holy Ghost. There, on the first anniversary of the Shiloh Pentecost, it was said that Agnes Osman spoke in Chinese and other languages she had never studied. The local newspaper carried a sample of what was supposed to be one of the languages in which Agnes was now gifted to speak and to write. No one has ever been able to identify any of what she wrote as a real language. Nevertheless, Parham insisted these tongues were foreign languages that were going to make it possible to evangelize the world before the second coming of Christ, which he said would take place by 1925. The students of Bethel College do not need to study in the old way to learn the languages. They have them conferred upon them miraculously. Different ones have already been enabled to converse with Spaniards, Italians, Bohemians, Hungarians, Germans, and French in their own language. I have no doubt that knowledge of Chinese, Japanese, the various dialects of the people of India, and even the language of the savages of Africa will be received during our meeting in the same way. I expect this gathering to be the greatest since the days of Pentecost. Despite such expectations, Bethel Bible College lost the lease on their building and would close a few months later. Parham was claiming the apostolic gifts of healing in tongues, but few consider whether he actually shared the faith of the apostles. He taught that Adam and Eve were created on the eighth day and were distinct from the humans created in the image of God on the sixth day. When Cain killed his brother, he fled to the land of Nod. There he took unto himself a wife, one of the six-day creation. Thus began the woeful intermarriage of races, for which cause the flood was sent in punishment, and has ever been followed by plagues and incurable diseases upon the third and fourth generation, the offspring of such marriages. Were time to last and intermarriage continue between the whites, the blacks, and the reds in America, consumption and other diseases would soon wipe the mixed bloods off the face of the earth. Parham agreed with Dowie and Sanford that Britain and the United States were the lost tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. He even charted out the lineage of Queen Victoria to show that she was the legitimate heir to David's throne. He insisted that only those who had the gift of tongues and were the physical descendants of Abraham would make up the 144,000 members of the Bride of Christ. Parham also denied the existence of hell, saying the wicked would be annihilated. As mentioned earlier, he tried to take over the Christian Catholic Apostolic Church in Zion, Illinois, after Dowie had been removed. As Dowie had declared himself the second Elijah, Parham now declared himself the third. Despite getting hundreds of followers, he wasn't able to oust Wilbur Valiva from the leadership of Zion and soon left Illinois for Texas. There he was arrested for sodomy and blamed Valiva for framing him. Parham was never convicted. But back in Zion, one of his disciples was soon convicted for killing several people in the name of divine healing. Like Dowie and Sanford, Parham taught them that healing was part of the atonement, and a lack of healing came from a lack of faith. His condemnation of doctors and medicine led to predictable results as his disciples tried to force the demons from Mrs. Letitia Greenhoff. Each arm cracked as it was bent away from the body where rheumatism had kept it locked for years. The victim seemed almost unconscious, but a spasm of pain more severe than the rest passed through her frame and the broken arms and legs rose in the air, seeming to push at Mitchell. He covered her head with a pillow, and as the motions ceased, he removed it, and seizing her by the head, gave her neck a severe wrench that dislocated the vertebrae. The body sank back, motionless. They continued working at the senseless muscles until they saw no response was given. What is the matter? asked the son. 
She is sleeping, replied Mrs. Mitchell. The demons have been cast out, and she will be well again. All of this was done as one of the Paramites sang in tongues, but Mrs. Greenhoff was dead. A local undertaker was persuaded to take the body without consulting the coroner, but an anonymous tip led to an investigation. It was discovered that Frank Crow, Bertha Young, and as many as nine others had died in similar exorcisms. If it's asserted that Parham's healings were better than those of his disciples, there's the case of nine-year-old Nettie Smith the next year. Her illness was routinely cured through medical care, but on Parham's advice, her father refused treatment. Despite Parham's prophesying she would be healed, she died. Parham might well have been forgotten to history if it wasn't for the work of another of his disciples. William Seymour was the son of former slaves. He went to Dowie Zion, but found no healing for his blind eye from Dowie, nor later from Charles Parham. But in January 1906, he spent several weeks at Parham's new Bible school in Houston, Texas. Though he had not experienced tongue speaking, he took the Pentecost message to Los Angeles in February 1906. On April 6, he prayed for Edward Lee, who spoke in tongues, and was quickly followed by others, including Seymour. The group was able to rent a chapel on Azusa Street and hold their first service on April 14th. Four days later, a massive earthquake and fires destroyed much of San Francisco to the north. Seymour was teaching the end of the world was at hand, and his newsletter was carrying prophecies of the imminent destruction of Los Angeles and Chicago. After five years of relatively slow growth, Pentecostalism took off. As Dowie had done in Chicago, Seymour covered the walls of Azusa Street with crutches, but he never regained sight in his blind eye. Some tried to divorce Azusa Street from Parham, but Seymour called him there in October and clearly identified it as part of the work Parham began five years earlier in Topeka. He called Parham God's leader in the apostolic faith movement. Many from Parham's Zion, Illinois group soon visited Azusa Street, including John G. Lake, Tom Hesmahawk, and F.F. F. Bosworth. Seymour would also visit Zion in 1907. For over three years, people packed the services day and night, but the promised judgments never materialized. Many drifted away. Some renounced the doctrine of the Trinity and started new churches. In a few years, attendance dropped to fewer than 30 people. Seymour and Parham had quickly split over what Parham described as Azusa's fanaticism, but both said only tongue speakers would make up the Bride of Christ and those tongues were foreign languages given for the evangelization of the world in the last generation. Numerous reports from the mission field testified to the contrary, and eventually the original claims gave way to the idea that tongues were a heavenly prayer language. The end times predictions that were supposed to explain the rise of these new apostles were also conveniently forgotten. But what of the healings? Surely resurrections from the dead testify to there being new apostles. Baby Olive may not have been raised at Bethel Church, but Olive Mills was raised at Shiloh. Here's Sanford's account as published by Parham. I found her without apparent sign of life. Her jaw had dropped and no breathing was perceptible. There was no evidence of pulsation. Those who called me declared that the woman was dead. As soon as I entered the room, I knelt by the bed and prayed in a whisper. Soon there was a fluttering of the eyelids, and a tremor ran through her limbs, and the woman regained her senses. In a few hours afterwards, she was talking with me in my study. Was she really dead? Was it truly a miracle? If death was so easily determined, why were people sometimes buried alive? Is Olive Mills really comparable to Lazarus? A few years later, the one-year-old son of Sanford's sister Annie Brown died. Sanford was reported in the Lisbon Enterprise as saying, If I don't bring that child to life, I'm a false prophet. For sixty days, they prayed over the boy's body without success. They finally buried him at night. If Sanford wasn't really healing people, was his Pentecost real? Was Parham's any more real a year later? Dr. Michael Brown calls all this a genetic fallacy. 
We're not supposed to judge Pentecostalism by the false claims about tongues and the false prophecies of Parham and Seymour. In his book Authentic Fire, he says we should instead focus on men like F.F. F. Bosworth, who he calls a balanced Pentecostal pioneer. But is it illegitimate to point out that Bosworth began his healing ministry as a deacon of Dowie's One True Church? To point out that he also taught Anglo-Israelism? Is it only guilt by association to point out that he was part of the Paramite congregation in Zion, Illinois, that killed as many as a dozen people? Is it illegitimate to point out that some of his supposed healings were reminiscent of Helen Sullivan's, and that doctors said James Buck died of what he was supposed to have been cured of days before? Is it illegitimate to point out that the man who wrote Christ the Healer and told people that it was always God's will to heal, to point out that he could find no healing for his wife and young son, but had to watch them die? Jesus commended the church in Ephesus that they had tested those who said they were apostles and found them liars. By what standard are we allowed to judge the claims of these modern apostles? The Mormon church claims their apostles still work miracles and raise the dead. But like the charismatic faith healers, they don't allow close scrutiny. We're supposed to simply accept their healings on faith. Are Joseph Smith's claims to reformed Egyptian in the Book of Mormon really any worse than Agnes Osmond's supposed Chinese? Are Smith's secret teachings on polygamy and gross immorality qualitatively worse than Dowie and Parham? Are Smith's false prophecies really that much worse than those of Dowie, Sanford, Parham, and Seymour? How do we test those who call themselves prophets and apostles? Pentecostalism was built on the claim that new apostles were being restored for the last days. They claimed that their authority was the same as the original ones. As we've seen, that's hard to maintain in the light of history in the Bible. If it's admitted that apostles ceased, then it's hard not to admit their sign gifts also ceased. Dr. Brown avoids these difficulties by arguing that the office of apostle never really went away. Now, without question, there are no apostles today who were like the 12 apostles, or even like Paul. And the 12, remember, they had to have seen Jesus in his ministry and then be witnesses to his crucifixion and his resurrection. And they had unique authority, and some of them wrote Scripture. So certainly there are no apostles today as there were apostles back then. But it's interesting. If you look in the New Testament, you'll see that others were also called apostles. For example, in Acts 14, Barnabas is called an apostle. And an apostle was simply an emissary, a sent one. These were pioneers these were planters, these were spiritual fathers. The question is, do these kind of people exist in the body today that could be called emissaries or small a apostles? As with other terms in the New Testament, apostle can have a broad or narrow meaning. Jesus is described as the apostle and high priest of our profession, and Epaphroditus is described as the Philippians' messenger or apostle to Paul. Yet there's clearly something unique about those whose names are on the foundation stones of the New Jerusalem and who equated their authority with the Old Testament prophets. Does Barnabas prove an ongoing office of apostle in the church? No. He was sent with Paul on a mission to the Gentiles. He was called an apostle and worked miracles. But Clement of Alexandria and other second-century Christians identified him as one of the 70 apostles in the 10th chapter of Luke's Gospel. They were sent out by Jesus with the power to heal and to cast out devils long before Pentecost, so Barnabas doesn't prove anything. The early church spoke of continuing bishops, elders, and deacons, but the only historic evidence Dr. Brown offers for continuing apostles is that the Didache includes instructions on how to treat apostles and prophets. His problem is that most scholars recognize it as having been written in the first century, when members of the Twelve and the Seventy were still alive. Brown acknowledges that the original apostles were eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection and that they wrote Scripture. But exactly how else do they differ from any other believer in his thinking? We also have an explicit promise on the words of Jesus. In John chapter 14, verse 12, the Greek is very straightforward. The one who believes in me, 
And that exact phrase is found six times in Greek in John's gospel. Again, very basic and simple. It is a universal promise. For example, in John 6.35, where Jesus says he's the bread of life, whoever believes in me will not thirst. In John 11.25, the same thing. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet will he live. The same thing in John 7.38, John 12.44, John 12.46. Very simple, very straightforward, universal promises stated in the clearest way, whoever believes in me. What does it say in John 14, 12? Whoever believes in me, the works that I do will he do also, and greater works will he do because I go to the Father. And the, contra- the context there is miraculous gifts, his miraculous display of, of, of power. Is it the plain reading of the text that every single person who truly believes on Jesus will heal the sick, as well as walk on water, feed multitudes, raise the dead, and do even greater things? When we ask how that fits with church history, Dr. Brown insists he won't build his theology on experience. But is his claim to having personally raised the dead really on par with Jesus raising Lazarus? The traditional understanding is that through the Holy Spirit, the works of Christ's disciples are greater in extent, not quality. Thousands were converted at Pentecost and millions and millions more in the subsequent centuries. This is far greater than the handful of believers in an upper room at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. But is it greater in quality? Should we also expect to do the works of Jesus in laying down our lives and taking them up again in three days? Compare Dr. Brown's interpretation with what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12. If every single believer is doing all the miraculous works of Jesus and greater works, what exactly were the signs that were supposed to differentiate the Apostles? A little later, Paul asked, Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues? The clear implication is that not everyone is an apostle, not everyone heals, and not everyone speaks in tongues. The context is that we are members of a body with different functions. Christ is the head of that body but he's no longer physically present with us. The idea that we need apostles physically present today is to misunderstand their role. They weren't simply gifted pioneers, but the ones given the keys of the kingdom to authoritatively interpret the scriptures. The ones promised the Holy Spirit to bring Jesus' words and deeds to remembrance and to lead them into all truth. They had unique miracles to testify of their authority. They weren't different simply because they wrote scripture but their writings were recognized as scripture because they were qualitatively different people. They were the foundation of the church, and like the chief cornerstone, only needed to be laid once. They appointed elders as their successors, not new apostles. In James 5, the sick are instructed to call these elders, to anoint them with oil and pray for their healing. If everyone has the power to heal, why specify the elders? especially when Paul doesn't list the gift of healing as one of their qualifications in 1 Timothy or Titus. As shown in the parable of the Good Samaritan, oil was standard treatment for a host of ailments. Even if what is being described is more than standard medical treatment and prayer, is what James describes here really the same as the shadow of Peter or the handkerchief of Paul making someone whole? Is it the same as raising the dead? Besides the twelve and the seventy, Who else do we see with the gift of healing in the New Testament? Stephen was endued with dunamis, and someone like uh, Philip preaches the gospel of the kingdom, and then the sick are healed, and demons are exorcised. I need explicit testimony that somehow that changed, and, and that ended with the apostles. Dr. Brown emphasizes the Spirit being poured out on all flesh in Acts 2 but he typically neglects to specify when and how that was accomplished in the years that followed. Stephen was already described as full of the Holy Spirit before the apostles laid hands on him, Philip, and the rest of the original deacons. But it was only after that laying on of hands that they are described as performing miracles. Philip preached the gospel in Samaria. People believed and were baptized. But in spite of Philip's miraculous powers, it was only when the apostles Peter and John went there and laid hands on the Samaritans that they received the Holy Spirit. Simon Magus was so impressed that he wanted to buy this gift from them. After Acts 2, 
the one occasion of the Spirit being given without the laying on of the apostles' hands, was when the Gentiles received the Spirit at the preaching of Peter and spoke in tongues, just as in Acts 2. This ultimately helped to make clear that they would be received without circumcision as well. Later in Acts 19, the Apostle Paul laid hands on the disciples of John the Baptist. They received the Spirit, spoke in tongues, and prophesied. There were other layings on of hands in the New Testament, just as in the Old. There was other preaching. But we see no one other than the Twelve and Paul being able to convey the miraculous gifts of the Spirit. When we begin to scrutinize the claims of modern apostles, Dr. Brown insists the scriptures are clear that the signed gifts can't pass away until the second coming. The Word of God tells us explicitly how long these things will last. Acts, the second chapter, when the Holy Spirit is poured out and the disciples speak in new languages, what, what does Peter say? He quotes from Joel and he says, this is what God said through Joel in the last days, and he adds the words, they're not found in the Hebrew, the Hebrew is just for Akrechein, but after this, he adds the words, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, not just the apostles, not just the leaders, all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. So the outpouring of the spirit is on all flesh in the last days. What's the period of the last days? Scripture is very clear on it. It's from the death and resurrection of Jesus until his return. We're in the last days now and have been in them for 2,000 years. There's nothing in the text that says anything about the last days being over 2,000 years. Dr. Brown is simply assuming that Joel is describing the second coming. But is he? And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. Was Joel simply skipping over thousands of years from Pentecost to the second coming? Or did he have another day of the Lord in mind? In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus uses the same language. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. That generation didn't pass away before those things were fulfilled. Within forty years, not one stone was left upon another of that temple. Signs in the sun and moon weren't for the second coming in Matthew 24, any more than in Isaiah 13 which was explicitly about the destruction of Babylon five and a half centuries earlier. Jesus did come on clouds in judgment against Jerusalem in that generation in the same way that God came on a cloud against Egypt hundreds of years earlier in Isaiah 19. The context in Joel clearly points to the last days before the judgment of apostate Israel, not to the judgment of the whole world thousands of years later. Tongues were a sign of God's judgment a sign that the kingdom was being taken from Israel and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. The temple was destroyed, the priesthood and sacrifices were taken away, and the gospel was going to the whole world. We clearly entered a new phase of redemptive history in 70 AD. Instead of recognizing the transitional ministry of the apostles, Dr. Brown insists Joel's last days must cover thousands of years, even if the text doesn't say so. He also points to 1 Corinthians 13. Even though Paul is saying the apostolic signs will cease, Dr. Brown insists that they won't cease until the second coming. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection in the mirror. Then we'll see face to face. So if you say that all of us have a face-to-face -face intimate relationship with God, that we hear his voice, he speaks to us, we speak to him without any hindrance, that it's not through a mirror, there's no faith involved because we see face-to-face. -face. If that's happened, then fine, maybe these things have ceased. But obviously we await that day when we will see him as he is. There are several problems with that reading. As Dr. Brown mentions, what the King James Version renders as glass is actually a mirror. Nowhere in the passage does it say that we see God in that mirror. Nowhere does it say that we will know Him as we are known, but simply that we will know as we are known. Brown's conflating 1 Corinthians 13 with 2 Corinthians 3 
but the contexts are different. And James uses the same Greek word when he describes a man beholding his own face in a mirror. Despite the claims that the Greek word teleos must mean Jesus' second coming, it's never used to mean that in any of its other 18 occurrences in the New Testament. It is, however, used in Hebrews for the perfected spiritual tabernacle that now stands in contrast with the temple that passed away in the first century. Dr. Brown also insists that prophecies in tongues can't pass away without knowledge also passing away. Where Paul says this, that tongues will cease, knowledge, he doesn't say word of knowledge, just as knowledge will pass away, prophecy will stop. When? When the perfect, when the complete comes. The idea that knowledge in 1 Corinthians 13.8 is referring to word of knowledge or revelatory knowledge, just show me where Paul uses that same word, knowledge, in 1 Corinthians. In that term, I'll consider it. But in and of itself, no, doesn't work. Sorry. Does ordinary knowledge make sense in the context of prophecy in tongues? And if all knowledge passes away, how will we know God or ourselves as we're known? Doesn't it make more sense that Paul is speaking of knowledge in the context of the gift of discernment as in John 7:17? 7, Dr. Brown also appeals to unity of the faith as something that has to be achieved before apostles can pass away. But he's confusing their purpose with their duration. None of these passages say apostles will continue until the second coming. But Dr. Brown has to maintain continuing apostles to have continuing apostolic gifts. He has to blur the distinctions between the apostles and other believers and blur their scope of ministry because it's one thing to portray Dowie as a flawed link in a long chain. It's something else entirely to have to defend his claims to being the new Elijah. Though Dr. Brown insists he won't build his theology on experience, he does often appeal to it in making a case for continuing apostles. It's fascinating that you have church leaders for centuries talking about prophecy and healing and miracles. And, and Augustine, about 1,600 years ago, when he was writing The City of God, he didn't believe that these things were still happening. But when they documented more than 70 miracles in two years, he said, obviously, the apostolic miracles and gifts still exist. Dr. Brown is putting words in Augustine's mouth. Nowhere does he say that apostolic miracles were happening. In fact, he draws a sharp distinction between the supposed miracles of his day and those of the apostles. For even now, miracles are wrought in the name of Christ, whether by his sacraments or by the prayers or relics of his saints. But they are not so brilliant and conspicuous as to cause them to be published with such glory as accompanied the former miracles. Even though Dr. Brown can't offer direct support for an ongoing office of apostle from the early church fathers, and the miracles aren't so brilliant, don't they still imply apostles? It depends on whether you believe Augustine's report of a man praying to the twenty martyrs for a coat, and then finding a fish with a gold ring in his belly. Do we believe the story of a boy crushed by an ox cart, who was healed when laid on the shrine of the martyr Stephen? Do prayers to saints and martyr shrines sound like biblical miracles or more like the beginnings of medieval superstition? If we accept these, do we also accept the third century account of the Acts of Peter and Andrew? Then Peter says, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ the Crucified, I order you, O camel, to go through this needle. And immediately the eye of the needle was opened and became like a gate, and the camel went through it. Peter again says to the camel, Go through it again, that all may see the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, in order that some may believe in him. Do we believe the story of St. Denis of Paris, who in the year 250 was beheaded for the faith, but was said to have picked up his head and walked several miles preaching repentance? One of Augustine's miracles involved a man named Kerma, a member of the Curia who laid near death. He revived and immediately sent people to check on a smith in the village who was also named Kerma. He said in his sickness, he heard that it was actually the other Kerma who was supposed to die. Word soon came back that the smith had died the very moment the first Kerma revived. Augustine testifies to having personally baptized this man. Do we believe this miracle? If we do, 
do we believe a similar story told a century later by Gregory the Great. His version has a man he personally knew named Stephen who died in Constantinople, but was left unburied overnight. He recovered and said his soul had been taken before the judge. There he heard it was another Stephen, a smith who was to be brought, and it was found he died at the very time the first Stephen was resurrected. If we believe these stories, do we believe the one told centuries before either by the pagan satirist Lucian of Samosata? He also told of a man who claimed to have been mistaken for a smith, who then died when he recovered. When we begin to scrutinize these miracles to which Dr. Brown points us, are we to believe that the God of the Bible is as inept as the pagan gods, and that there was something about smiths that confused him? Lucian said charlatans found easy wealth among gullible Christians in the second century. There was superstition in the church, but there were also those who saw the scriptures as the remedy to that superstition, because the miracles of the actual prophets and apostles were qualitatively different than the supposed miracles of their own day. If there are continuing apostles, doesn't that mean that they have the same authority to define the faith as the biblical ones? Dr. Brown says no. Are there apostles in the capital A sense, like the 12? Are they around today? No, no, certainly not. Are there people who are apostles in the sense of emissaries, pioneers, planters with that powerful anointing and a certain divine authority and backing? I say certainly yes. I say they've been here through church history up until today. And if we recognize that calling, the better we can work with it. Like Wayne Grudem. Dr. Brown tries to differentiate between levels of inspiration. We know that there is plenty of inspired speech that is not Bible. So it's a different level of inspiration. Uh, when the prophets spoke all the prophecies that are not recorded in the Bible from Old Testament prophets, you had Samuel and the school of prophets and things, yet we don't have their words re recorded. So all the prophecies from Old Testament times that were not recorded, and the abundant prophecies that were delivered in New Testament times that were not recorded, if they were spoken by the Spirit, there was a certain level of inspiration, but they were not God-breathed the same way that Scripture was. Where exactly does God tell us that prophecies not recorded in Scripture weren't God-breathed? Dr. Brown displays here a fundamental confusion on the nature of Scripture. Were the teachings of Jesus not recorded in the Bible really less authoritative than those that were? Why not? If it's because of who Jesus is, we have to remember who the apostles were. They were sinners, but they were also those given the Spirit to speak the Word of God authoritatively like the Old Testament prophets. They were Jesus' official representatives, given miraculous signs to attest to their authority. According to 2 Thessalonians 2.15, was Paul's oral teaching really less authoritative than his written teaching? The Scriptures were never meant to be exhaustive, but sufficient. John said the world couldn't contain all the books needed to recount the works of Jesus. The same could be said for all his words and all the words of his apostles. God providentially preserved what was necessary for his church, but nowhere in the Bible do we find support for Dr. Brown's claim that true prophets gave prophecies of differing qualities and only the highest quality was included in Scripture. Such an idea implies an authority higher than the Scriptures. Dr. Brown seems to imply as much when he raises issues about how the canon of the New Testament was fixed. Does the church really define the teachings of the apostles, or do the teachings of the apostles define the church? Were the Apostle Paul's letters only authoritative when they were canonized, or were they canonized because they were recognized as apostolic and therefore God-breathed? Contrary to charismatic claims, the infallible God-breathed word is not dependent on the character of its messenger. It could come from a Balaam or Caiaphas as easily as from an Isaiah. God was very clear that Israel should test prophets, and if something they prophesied didn't come to pass, they were to be put to death as false prophets. Remember the multitude of prophecies that Nabil would be healed? How should the church respond to those who presumed to prophesy when the words weren't from God? Dr. Brown points to 1 Corinthians 14, in 1 Thessalonians 5, to argue that we no longer judge prophets, but prophecies, sorting out the good from the bad. How does he propose that we do that? We are all indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The entire New Testament church, in a sense, is prophetic. 
and, and therefore we can discern whether this is the voice of the Spirit or not. We can rightly judge even beyond uh, just uh, holding up the criteria of Scripture A and B, seeing whether something comes to pass. We can actually have witness in our spirit that a word is from God or not from God. God tells us our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We're told the fool trusts in his own heart. Does Dr. Brown's standard really work? I have read of the great men and women of faith. One in particular intrigues me so much. His name, Smith Wigglesworth. He had some of the most outrageous miracles I ever heard of in my life. Uh, Let me give you one example. Some parents had a two-month-old baby dying in the hospital. The parents kidnapped the child, took the child to a Smith Wigglesworth meeting, and Smith looks at the child, looks at the parents and says, can I do what God tells me to do? Well, what would you do if you were the parents? The child's dying anyway, right? He takes the baby, two-month-old, throws the baby against the wall, the baby. Then the baby's on the floor. He ta- have you ever seen someone play soccer? Have you ever seen them uh, kick a soccer ball? He does that with the baby. The baby falls into the congregation. No crying. Is it dead? 100% healed. If Wigglesworth's claims are to be believed, then wouldn't Dr. Brown have to tell us that throwing and kicking babies isn't too outrageous? How did that same standard work for Letitia Greenhoff? How did it work for those who stepped out in faith and withheld medicine from their children? How did it work for those who believed Frank Sanford that those who trusted God would never hunger? When we point out such real-world applications, Dr. Brown insists that he won't build his theology on experience. But is he reading the Bible for what it really says? God was able to make even Balaam's ass to speak. Where exactly does he tell us that he no longer delivers infallible words through his prophets? Is Paul really telling us in 1 Thessalonians 5 to pick through prophecies? Such a reading requires a fundamental break from the Old Testament standard of infallibility. It's also counter to what we see elsewhere in the New Testament. The same Greek word is used in 1 John 4, not for identifying false parts of prophecies, but false prophets. There's a litany of other passages that warn Christians of false prophets. But by Dr. Brown's standard, how do we discern false prophets from confused brothers, ravening wolves from deceived sheep? The whole system creates a conundrum in that how do we test the testers? And how do we test those who test the testers? And then how do we test those who test them? What is our ultimate authority? Despite denying that modern apostles have the same authority as the biblical ones, Dr. Brown claims they do have divine authority. Are there people who are apostles in the sense of emissaries, pioneers, planters with that powerful anointing and a certain divine authority and backing? I say certainly yes. What exactly is the nature of that authority? Where do we find it in God's Word? We're not told. The closest thing to continuing apostles in the early church was Montanus, who arose in Phrygia about the year 156. He claimed to be a prophet and was soon joined by two prophetesses, Priscilla and Maximilla, who abandoned their husbands to join him. They uttered ecstatic speech and were prophesying the imminent descent of the New Jerusalem in Phrygia. They claimed healings and other miracles, but their specific prophecies consistently failed, especially regarding the second coming. In spite of this, they grew by denouncing other Christians as carnal and dead, while insisting that they were the truly spiritual. The church historian Eusebius reports that rather than testing prophecies, the church tested the prophets. Despite warnings that they were blaspheming the Holy Spirit, they tested them according to the Bible and found them to be counterfeits. Montanism was denounced by a church synod in the year 177. Just as many rejected the apostles' authority to define the faith in the early church, much of church history has been a battle between those who seek to hold to the faith once delivered by the biblical apostles and those who claim that they have something better. What Rome was teaching in the 16th century was neither biblical nor Catholic. 
The Pope claimed not only apostolic traditions from outside the scriptures, but he also said he had the keys of the kingdom as the supposed successor of the Apostle Peter. He insisted that he defined the apostolic faith because he had apostolic authority and pointed to a multitude of supposed miracles to back up his claims. The Protestant Reformation wasn't about a new Pentecost, but about going back to the scriptures and to the historic faith of the church. In his final edition of the Institutes of the Christian Religion, John Calvin quoted over 800 times from the Church Fathers to demonstrate that they were reading the Scriptures the same as the Reformers, and contrary to Rome. We deal with all this in another video, but what's not so well understood is that many who broke from Rome weren't rejecting popes so much as wanting to become ones. Nearly everything found in 20th century Pentecostalism was found among the 16th century Anabaptist. Miraculous healings, prophecies, speaking in tongues, along with modern apostles and prophets. Many consider this a badge of honor, because they equate Anabaptists with stories like that of Dirk Willems, who lost his life stopping to save one of his pursuers, who had fallen through the ice. As with Pentecostalism, there were many sincere and pious Anabaptists, but for most, Anabaptism wasn't about reform, as much as revolution. As Joseph Smith would do 300 years later, the Anabaptist Thomas Munzer claimed a great apostasy took place soon after the death of the apostles. The Christian congregation did not remain a virgin any longer than up to the time of the death of the disciples of the apostles, and soon thereafter became an adulteress. Such an apostasy meant there was no true church left to reform. I desire from you only that which your diligence should demand. You should study the living word of God out of God's own mouth. Through this, you will see, hear, and grasp how the whole world has been seduced by deaf parsons. Help me, for the sake of Christ's blood, to fight against such high enemies of the faith. In the spirit of Elijah, I want to ruin them in your eyes. For the new apostolic church will arise first in your land and afterward everywhere. Thomas Munzer will not pray to a dumb god, but rather to one who speaks. For the reformers, an apostolic church was one that held to the teachings of the apostles, one where the Spirit was speaking by and with the scriptures. Munzer insisted the letter kills, and an apostolic church required a new Pentecost with new prophets and apostles, and new revelations. One cannot leap up to heaven with one's head. There has to be a profound sense of wonder, of the inner word in the depths of the soul. Without this, you cannot ascend, though you have gobbled up 100,000 Bibles. Munzer claimed the Spirit had told him the time of Jesus' return was now and the kingdom of God was to be established through communism and the slaughter of God's enemies. And now, you princes, let not yourselves be beguiled by the stuffy scribes. The peasants have better insight. You are kind-hearted and think your function is simply to preserve the peace. But Moses in Deuteronomy calls for the extermination of the Canaanites. Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. And again, bring my enemies and slay them before my face. If you are to be rulers, you must take the enemies of the elect and slay them before your eyes. You say, leave it to God, and your sword is left to rust in its scabbard. But a tree which beareth not good fruit is rooted up and cast into the fire. The godless man has no right to live. After peasants took up arms and started slaughtering the landowners, an army came against them in 1525. Munzer led 7,000 peasants into battle at Frankenhausen, prophesying that they were ushering in the second coming. His banner was a rainbow to remind them how God had destroyed the wicked with a flood. When an actual rainbow appeared in the sky, he said it was a sign from God that they would win. But by the end of the battle, over 6,000 peasants were dead. By comparison, the prince has only lost four men. Munzer ran from the slaughter and hid, but he was soon caught and executed. Just as many try to divorce Dowie and Sanford from Pentecostal history, 
Many tried to divorce Munzer from the Anabaptists who followed him. But the official father of Anabaptism, Conrad Grable, along with six others, wrote to Munzer eight months before his death. They addressed him as the true and faithful proclaimer of the gospel, Thomas Munzer of Allstead in the Hearts, our faithful and dear brother in Christ. They praised his book on baptism and signed the letter, Seven New Young Munzers to Luther. Everywhere, Anabaptists were claiming miracles, tongues, and prophecies justified them in revolution, even after Munzer's execution. Hans Hut preached subjects should murder all the authorities, for the opportune time has arrived. He prophesied the second coming would take place in 1528. Though that too failed, the Anabaptists, like the Montanists, continued to grow by declaring themselves the truly spiritual, while denouncing their opponents as carnal and dead. Munzer called Luther Brother Fattened Swine and Brother Soft Life. Anabaptists pointed to his inconsistency in Reformation to justify complete revolution. They also kept producing new prophecies to distract from their old ones. In 1525, Melchior Hoffman said he, rather than Munzer, was the new Elijah, who would prepare the way for Jesus' return by the 24th of March, 1534. Like Frank Sanford, Hoffman claimed to be one of the two witnesses of Revelation 11 and said Strasbourg would be the seat of the New Jerusalem. The Anabaptist pilgrim Marpeck testified to miraculous healings there, including raising people from the dead. Though Hoffman called for peaceful waiting, others took up the sword. Hans Crew confessed in 1533 to being part of an Anabaptist band of murderers and arsonists. He admitted to killing five people, including a woman he raped and murdered for refusing rebaptism. Hoffman was in prison, and though he had already named another disciple as Enoch, the supposed second witness of Revelation 11, Jan Mathis declared he was the true Enoch and was assuming leadership. Shortly after, he also claimed God had told him to abandon his wife for a teenage girl. Hoffman had suspended rebaptisms, but Mathis restarted them on November 1, 1533. One of the first to be rebaptized was Jan Bockelson of Leiden, who was quickly made an apostle. Mathis sent such apostles throughout the land to herald the coming end and baptize people in preparation. Obi Phillips describes two coming to his town and promising no more Christian blood would be shed, but that the Lord would soon destroy all the ungodly. I did not dare to contradict this, because it was then the time that none dared to say much in opposition. And whoever spoke against this would immediately be resisting and slandering the Spirit. These two apostles who were prophesying no more Christian blood would be shed were executed a few weeks later in Amsterdam. Jan of Leiden went with another apostle to Munster in January of 1534. The radical preacher Bernard Rothman and much of the town accepted rebaptism and declared Munster the kingdom of Zion. In February, the Anabaptist Bernard Nipperdowling managed to take control of the city council. Mathis soon arrived and declared that Munster, not Strasbourg, was to be the new Jerusalem. Calls were sent out to come there for the end of the world. The Prince Bishop gathered an army to blockade the city and stopped a caravan of 15,000 Anabaptists from entering. As the new Enoch, Mathis called for the cleansing of the new Jerusalem by exterminating all who would not submit to rebaptism. Jan of Leiden convinced him to let them simply leave instead. Mathis also declared money unclean and said people should turn over what they had in money and food and trust that God would provide. When Jesus' promised return didn't take place by March 24th, Mathis received a new prophecy that it would happen by Easter. He later went into a trance and prophesied that God had made him the new Gideon. He led a dozen men out of the city, confident that God would give them victory over the thousands that opposed them. He and his men were killed and chopped into pieces. In spite of this, the Anabaptists were confident that he was one of the two witnesses of Revelation 11 and would rise up in three and a half days and destroy their enemies. They gathered the pieces of his body in baskets and waited. When nothing happened, Jan of Leiden said Mathis had received a true vision, but that his death was a result of sin. He said he had received a new vision, assuring them that they were the true apostolic church and that the second coming was at hand. The people celebrated with ecstatic dancing, chanting, O Father, O Father, give love, give love. 
Men ran through the streets with swords, declaring that God could no longer wait for those who wouldn't convert. While the frantic dancing went on for hours, others ran through the streets naked. Jan had a vision that he was the new King David, and he was to take Mathis' widow as his queen, even though he already had a wife. Polygamy was soon commanded for everyone, because Jan said God wanted them to be fruitful and multiply. At first, both the man and the woman were to seek the Spirit's confirmation. But when that produced too few marriages, confirmation was only needed for the man. Previous marriages were declared void, so women whose husbands were outside the city were commanded to remarry and threatened with death if they tried to leave. Any woman over 15 who refused marriage or conjugal rights to her new husband was executed. Jan personally took 16 wives, 15 of them teenagers. When one of them criticized him for feasting while the people starved, Jan beheaded her. He taught, like most Anabaptists of the time, that the restoration of the church meant denying the deity of Christ as a tradition of men. He also began tearing down church buildings in the city as symbols of oppression. As God's prophet, Jan made complaining and even idle conversation punishable by death. As Munster resisted the siege for over a year, they inspired Anabaptist uprisings in other cities, including Amsterdam. Naked prophets running through the streets soon gave way to armed revolt. Despite numerous prophecies to the contrary, these uprisings were unsuccessful, and Munster fell. All of its men were slaughtered. The leaders were tortured, executed, and their bodies hung in cages from St. Lambert's Church. Yet even after the fall of Munster, Anabaptists were claiming apostolic gifts and visions that assured them that the Second Coming was at hand and that the Spirit was leading them to slaughter the ungodly. The Anabaptists didn't bring their promised Pentecost. Their cries to not despise prophecies actually led them to despise the biblical prophets and apostles. They were more akin to medieval Catholic mysticism or modern Mormonism than biblical Christianity. Their prophets and apostles were all counterfeits. All their predictions of the end were false. Obi Phillips was the leader of a group of Anabaptists known as the Obanites. He renounced Anabaptism in disgust. We all taught many blasphemies and considered it was a true, pure, and saintly thing to denounce others as heretics and godless. He denounced his false brethren, those whose prophecies had confirmed Melchior Hoffman in his delusions. Everything that he so boldly professed from the mouth of the prophets and prophetesses, he, in the end, found it all falsehood and deception. What spirit compelled this performance, office, and commission? I will let each judge for himself. The Obanites who clung to Anabaptism eventually changed their name to the Mennonites and pursued an explicit pacifism. But many disillusioned Anabaptists found a home in Reformed churches. John Calvin's wife, Idolette, had been an Anabaptist in Hoffman Strasbourg. Just as the Pope's claims to apostolic authority and miracles had been weighed and found wanting, so were the claims and miracles of his self-appointed replacements. The Reformed looked for the Spirit bearing witness by and with the Scriptures, not in addition or contrary to them. Instead of a new Pentecost, Reformed churches emphasized the faith once for all delivered to the saints, a church that exercised more consistent discipline than the Lutherans, and sought a more thoroughgoing Reformation but without the prophets and apostles of Anabaptism. There were many other false prophets between the Anabaptists and the Pentecostals. In 1630s New England, Anne Hutchinson claimed direct revelations she said were as authoritative as Scripture, even though her prophecy for the destruction of Massachusetts failed. In 1647 in England, George Fox claimed the gift of prophecy. He denounced the churches as having a dead faith and lacking real power. He said they were beyond Reformation and needed a new Pentecost. His followers ran through the streets naked with shouts of imminent judgment. Fox was arrested for interrupting worship services and shouting down sermons. He said God had told him to reveal the church's idolatry of the Bible, because all were now prophets, and God's still small voice was far superior to anything in the Scriptures. So long as the Quakers were focused on what they were against, they had unity. But when imprisonment forced Fox to call for moderation, the more radical ones began denouncing Fox and interrupting his worship services. In 
in spite of moderating some of their behavior. The Quakers never gave up on their claim that there had been a great apostasy. They continued to reject not only the Trinity, but also the substitutionary atonement as a tradition of men. In the early 1700s, radical elements among the French Protestants professed themselves to be new prophets. They claimed gifts of healings and tongues, and believed that they would all live to see the second coming. When one of their leaders, Thomas Eames, died, it was prophesied he would rise from the grave on May 25, 1708, followed soon thereafter by the second coming. All such prophecies failed. Despite the Quakers insisting that they had the authentic inner light, the shaking Quakers, or shakers, split from them in 1747, declaring that their inner light was better. Inspired by the French prophets, they adopted ecstatic worship, which sometimes included uncontrollable laughter, dancing, and falling on the floor. Some charismatics point to them as forerunners in the use of ecstatic tongues, but they tend to downplay that the leader, Mother Anne Lee, claimed to be the second coming of Jesus. She said that the Spirit told her that to be perfect, Christians must be celibate and give all their possessions to the church. Despite many purported healings and claims of fulfilled prophecy, her prophecy for the imminent descent of the New Jerusalem proved false. In 1814, Wesleyan prophetess Joanna Southcote announced she was pregnant with a new Messiah at the age of 64. Despite gathering 100,000 followers around London, the birth never took place. The 1820s saw Edward Irving claim miraculous healings and speaking in tongues. Some charismatics point to his Catholic Apostolic Church as a forerunner of Pentecostalism, but they tend to overlook that he said the last generation began in 1823. In one sense, Dr. Brown's correct that there have been many people claiming apostolic power throughout church history, but other than the popes, they didn't say they were part of an ongoing office or gift. They said they were bringing a new Pentecost for the end of the world, and that end never came when prophesied. Their supposed miracles weren't really comparable to Peter, Paul, or even to Pharaoh's magicians. They were far more similar to those of Joseph Smith. Can we question Joseph Smith's claims to being a prophet without blaspheming the Holy Spirit? Can we insist that questioning his claims isn't a lack of faith, but rather faithfulness to God? Can we point out that by God's standard, the burden is on the prophet to prove his claims, and that false prophecies really do make him a false prophet? When they point to Joseph Smith raising the dead in front of witnesses, can we point out that visibly breathing again after a couple of minutes isn't necessarily raising the dead? Can we point out that some of his disciples were caught faking resurrections? When they point to Jonah to excuse Smith's unfulfilled prophecies, can we remind them that Jonah's prophecy brought repentance, but Smith's didn't? Can we point out that their tongues weren't really the foreign languages they first claimed them to be? When they insist the church must have modern prophets, because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, can we point out that God no longer uses temples made with hands, and that something fundamentally changed with the coming of Jesus and the sending of the gospel to the whole world? Can we point out that their new revelations aren't really adding to the Bible, but taking away from it? Mormons may give lip service to believing the Bible, but they subordinate it to what they believe the Spirit is telling them internally. The Lord said to the prophet Joseph, Behold, I say unto you that you must study it out in your mind. Then you must ask me if it be right, and if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore you shall feel that it is right. You shall feel that it is right. And if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore you shall feel that it is right. We have something better than feelings. We have the Spirit speaking by and with the objective God-breathed scriptures in our hearts. In those scriptures, God tells us that even if what a prophet says comes to pass, he's to be rejected if he says to follow another god. Smith said he was a prophet of Elohim, but his was an exalted man who was one among a multitude of gods. Smith's Jesus was merely our elder spirit brother. He was born through Elohim physically fathering a child with his own great-great-granddaughter. <laughs> 
Smith may have used biblical names, but his God was not the God of the Bible. Preaching another God isn't the only thing that disqualifies a prophet. The Apostle Paul said that even if he or an angel from heaven were to declare any other gospel than what had been received, they were to be anathema. It's not blaspheming the Spirit to denounce Smith as a false prophet and his gospel as a counterfeit. It's not unloving to tell Mormons that as sincere as they may be, they're sincerely wrong. Whether their miracles are tricks, delusions, or demonic is largely irrelevant, because they're clearly not from God. He has spoken, and he is not an exalted man, nor one among many gods. The gates of hell did not prevail against his church. That church is to be reformed according to the scriptures, but Smith's restoration is a wholesale counterfeit. By the same standard, so is Pentecostalism's. Our issue with Bill Johnson's glory cloud isn't that it's too showy, but that it's not showy enough. It's not qualitatively better than Mormon miracles. For that matter, the miracles at Bethel aren't qualitatively better than Peter Popoff's. To compare healings that are incomplete, temporary, and unverifiable to those of the biblical apostles is to cast doubt on the whole Christian faith and to equate what modern apostles teach with the biblical ones is to rewrite that faith. Dr. Brown points to embarrassing teachings of Martin Luther to excuse the Anglo-Israelism of Charles Parham, but he misses the point. Luther wasn't claiming to be a divinely inspired prophet of a new Pentecost. If the new prophets and apostles are just as liable to error as non-Pentecostal preachers, why exactly do we need them? Brown's also glossing over the fact that the Spirit was supposedly giving a host of other modern prophets the very same error. Anglo-Israelism was taught by Dowie, Sanford, Parham, Bosworth, Gordon Lindsay, Clem Davies, George Jeffries, John G. Lake, and Arthur Dalimore, just to name a few. Then there were charismatics like William Branham, who prophetically taught that Eve had sex with the serpent and Cain was the result. And then there are those who teach a God who is not that far removed from that of Joseph Smith. God's reason for creating Adam was his desire to reproduce himself. I mean a reproduction of himself. And in the Garden of Eden, he did that. He was not a little like God. He was not almost like God. He was not um, subordinate to God even. Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifested in the flesh. Many charismatics are fine with holding Mormonism to the light of God's Word in the Bible. But when the same standard shows their prophets and apostles are teaching different gods and different gospels, when it shows theirs don't compare to the real ones, we're accused of despising prophecy. But the Holy Spirit has already spoken, clearly warning us of such deceivers, giving us a standard by which to test them. To ignore that, to compare vague, fallible impressions with the God-breathed scriptures, that's to truly despise prophecy. It's great hearing the voice of the Lord. It's great when he speaks to us to help someone else. Uh, and it's, it's everybody. It, hearing his voice is not for prophets. It's for everybody. It's for all Christians. We're his friends. You talk to your friends, right? Now, see, until that conversation, I would never have known to pay attention to faint impressions or something as brief as a color floating across the room. I would never have known that God would speak like that. I never knew a prophet. And I saw, how, I saw prophets getting revelation, but the Bible doesn't tell you how it got them, right? Faint impressions are not how we see God deliver his word to his prophets in the Bible. When we presume to declare such impressions divine prophecy, it allows us to remake the faith into whatever we want it to be, all while claiming to be spiritual. Many charismatics believe that if Roman Catholics speak in tongues, they must have the Spirit, and if they have the Spirit, they must have the Gospel. But that's judging things backwards.
Rome may reject Mormonism's polytheism better than Kenneth Copeland does, but they stand with the Mormons in adding other revelations to the scriptures and in adding works to grace. Like Mormons, they may use biblical terms, but theirs is a false gospel. Whatever spirit is leading them is not the Holy Spirit. The Protestant reformers didn't suffer and die over matters of taste and preference, but over whether the Apostle Paul was right when he said that a gospel of grace and works cannot save. The Reformation was about rejecting Rome's counterfeit gospel, along with its counterfeit claims to apostolic authority and its counterfeit miracles. It was about the sufficiency of both the scriptures and of grace. As with Rome, how many charismatic claims really stand up to biblical scrutiny? Some may point to some personal prediction that came true, but fallible prophecies are less like Isaiah and Paul and more like those of the psychics. Whether the psychics and charismatic prophets are demonic, con artists, or self-deceived is largely irrelevant because it's clear that what they're saying isn't from God. Mormons tell potential converts to read James chapter 1 verse 5 and then to pray to know if the Book of Mormon is true. It sounds so pious to go directly to God, but it's actually sinful presumption. If they simply kept reading their Bibles, they would know that Mormonism wasn't true, and whatever feeling says it is, is a lie. Rather than seeking new revelations, God's Word gives us clear direction if we take the time to study it. There's nothing wrong in asking the Lord to illumine the Scriptures through His Spirit and to look for providential direction, so long as it's within the bounds of God's revealed will. But when we equate feelings with biblical prophecy, we're misleading ourselves and demeaning God's Word. It's not quenching the Spirit to recognize that apostles and prophets have ceased. Modern pretenders can't hold up to biblical scrutiny, and neither can modern tongues. They're not foreign languages for the evangelization of the world, so they're not what Parham and Seymour said they were. And even many charismatics admit they're not what we see in Acts chapter 2. Tongues are called mysteries, but that doesn't mean that they're a private prayer language. The Greek word mysterion is used 28 times in the New Testament. Far from being mysterious as we've transliterated the word into English, the word is used for what was once hidden but is now being revealed. Tongues are a form of prophecy. In Acts chapter 2, speaking in tongues is said to be the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, that sons and daughters shall prophesy. In 1 Corinthians 14, they're translatable, and if translated, they're equated with prophecy. Contrary to Dr. Brown's claims, the Bible only recognizes true prophets and false prophets. If someone translates what you say, will you really insist that it's a revelation from God? And if it's not, are you qualitatively different from Joseph Smith? Even if someone says you're only praising God in another language, remember that Agnes Osmond was told the same, but she wasn't. Dr. Brown argues in Authentic Fire that tongues didn't start at Topeka in 1901, but were done in India in the 1860s. He neglects to point out that they were done by the Mormons in the 1830s, the Shakers before that, the Anabaptists before that, and the Montanists before that. He loves to quote Augustine about miracles, but he doesn't quote him nearly as much about tongues. In the earliest times, the Holy Spirit fell upon them that believe, and they spoke with tongues which they had not learned, as the Spirit gave them utterance. These were signs adapted to the time. For there was this betokening of the Holy Spirit in all tongues, to show that the gospel of God was to run through all tongues over the whole earth. That thing was done for a sign, and it passed away. We hear the same testimonies to tongues ceasing from Chrysostom and a host of others in the early church. None of these men were perfect, but they stood for a truly Catholic faith, one that had been delivered once for all by Jesus' apostles in the Scriptures. Rome has long since abandoned that faith. The question is, will you stand with Augustine and Chrysostom, the Protestant reformers, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, and a host of others? Or will you stand with Thomas Munzer, George Fox, 
Joseph Smith, and John Alexander Dowie, claiming that there has been a great apostasy and that you are now part of a new restoration. You can reject both options, as Dr. Brown does, and try to claim that charismaticism is the historic faith of the Church. But as we've seen, the same spirit that supposedly gave Montanist, Anabaptist, and Quakers healings and tongues consistently gave them false prophecies. No matter how tongues may make you feel, God offers us better prophets and apostles than charismaticism. They have better miracles, better revelations, and better experiences of God because those experiences are rooted in God's revelation of himself through his spirit and his word. The choice is not between a dead church and one in which the spirit manifests in glory clouds. Both are poor imitations of a truly biblical church. This is Lee Wilson. In 2007, he was diagnosed with stage 4 bladder cancer. It had metastasized to his lungs. The doctors told him it was inoperable and incurable. He only had weeks to live. Our congregation joined with his and others in praying fervently for his healing. He took his wife to Hawaii for one last visit and began to feel strangely. He went back to his doctor and found he had gone into spontaneous remission. Without the aid of a modern apostle or prophet, he is still well over 13 years later. This is Augustine Durbin. Doctors told his mother he would be born with severe spina bifida and crippled for life. Numerous ultrasounds confirmed their diagnosis, so she was preparing to abort him. When the Durbins told her they would adopt him as their own, she agreed. Our congregation joined with theirs in praying for God to heal him while still in the womb. Without the aid of a modern apostle or prophet, Augustine was born perfectly healthy. We have no doubt that God still answers prayer, and sometimes miraculously. But it doesn't surprise us that such healings are rare. The apostolic miracles serve their purpose in demonstrating the apostles' authority to speak on God's behalf. The modern apostles' inability to heal isn't because the sick lack faith, but because they're not real apostles. Many will object that Jesus healed everyone and that we should make no allowance for sickness in our theology. The question is asked, isn't it always God's will to heal? And the biblical answer is no. For all the charismatic proof texting from 1 Corinthians, most fail to see that the Corinthian church wasn't nearly as spiritual as they thought they were. Their expectations of the Christian life were actually very carnal. The Apostle Paul told the Corinthians the kingdom wasn't in word but in power. But it wasn't the power they imagined they'd found. Now ye are full, now ye are rich. Ye have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God ye did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst, and are naked, and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place, and labor working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. The Apostle Paul prayed three times that his thorn in the flesh would be taken away, but he was told God's grace was sufficient and God's power, God's dunamis, was perfected in Paul's weakness. Though Bill Johnson declares it another gospel to allow for sickness, Paul uses the same word for his infirmities there as for Timothy's, for which he encouraged him to drink wine. Paul wasn't violating God's will or forfeiting his apostolic gifts to leave Trophimus sick in Miletus. God doesn't promise us heaven here and now. He doesn't promise deliverance from physical suffering or death here and now. He promises to be with us in the midst of our trials and to use them for our good. Among the people who flocked to Pentecostalism in 1906 was Benjamin Irwin, 
In 1891, he had been a Baptist pastor in Nebraska when he claimed he experienced a second work of grace in complete sanctification, complete freedom from the power of sin. Then in 1895, he claimed a third work, what he called the baptism with fire. Would these brethren limit the Holy One of Israel and set boundaries to the possibilities of grace when God has promised to do for us exceedingly above all we can ask or think? These dear brethren appear to have been suddenly and violently attacked by a hitherto unknown spiritual malady, which I have named pyrophobia. This blessed baptism deepens and intensifies our love toward God, makes us more intensely loyal to God, more humble, more Christ-like, gives us a clearer insight into the nature of the adorable Trinity, gives us a greater abhorrence of sin and a more agonizing passion for souls. Irwin's Fire Baptized Holiness Church grew rapidly and created a sensation with what were supposed to be powerful manifestations of the Spirit's baptism with fire. Irwin soon added the baptism of dynamite, and then baptisms of the even more explosive lidite, oxidite, and selenite. But in 1900, Irwin was revealed to regularly employ prostitutes. He left the church and abandoned his family, marrying a new wife without bothering to divorce the first. He would occasionally show up in the newspapers as a drunk or the victim of theft. Then, in 1906, Reports from Azusa Street led him to the Apostolic Faith Mission in Salem, Oregon. Irwin said tongues had finally given him what he had been looking for all these years. He became an evangelist for Pentecostalism, moving to Los Angeles in 1908 to be at Azusa Street. But by 1910, he abandoned the church and his second family. His wife was left to beg day-old bread to keep their children from starving. Rather than chasing the fire, Rather than seeking ever new experiences of power of the Spirit, Irwin should have been asking whether he had ever really been converted. It's an issue that goes back to what Dr. Brown calls the holy, Jesus-centered roots of the Pentecostal movement. He says it was birthed directly out of Wesleyan holiness roots. As with the Anabaptist, that's supposed to be a badge of honor. One of my great heroes as a young theological student was John Wesley. Wesley traveled 250,000 miles by horseback preaching. He preached 40,000 sermons in his life. Compute that. Bill Johnson has also written a book celebrating John Wesley as a model of the Christian faith. No matter what criticisms are leveled against modern charismatics, or even the old-time religion of Parham and Seymour. In Wesley, many think they found an unimpeachable champion against Calvinism and cessationism, a champion of holiness who was mightily used in a great revival. The problem is that just as many fail to really study Anabaptist and Pentecostal histories, they also fail to study Wesley's. John Wesley despised the doctrine of predestination as taught in the 39 Articles of the Church of England but he gave enough lip service to it to get himself ordained. He labored together with Calvinists like George Whitfield in the founding of Methodism, but over the years Wesley became more and more hardened in his position. He said predestination represents the most holy God as worse than the devil, as both more false, more cruel, and more unjust. He concluded a rejection of predestination also required a rejection of the imputed righteousness of Jesus as sufficient for salvation. He argued like Rome for an imparted righteousness that only justifies us when we are fully sanctified. He believed that if the command to repent and believe implied man's ability to do so, then so did the command to be perfect. Christians needed to look for a second work of grace in complete sanctification. Only then could they be confident of their salvation. It's that search for a second work that defined the holiness movement and laid the groundwork for Pentecostalism. If conversion is seen as simply a matter of walking an aisle and praying a prayer, such ideas can sound reasonable. But real conversion is so much more than Wesley would admit. It's a new birth involving the great exchange. God takes out our hearts of stone and gives us new hearts that love him. Jesus takes our sins upon himself and pays their penalty on the cross 
while imputing his perfect righteousness to us. He nails our poisonous life to the cross and puts his Holy Spirit in us. We don't need a second work of grace, because sanctification is the work of the same Spirit who gave us faith and now indwells us, as exhibited in the 39 Articles and all the Protestant confessions. The Reformers were agreed that this new birth was a sovereign work of God. There is a free offer of the gospel, but we're dead in our trespasses and sins. The things of God are foolishness to us. We have to be born again to ever come to the light. Wesley used the language of the new birth. He admitted grace was necessary, but like Rome, he said it wasn't sufficient. We have to continuously work to be justified. The scriptures also weren't sufficient. He was constantly casting lots, looking for signs, and opening the Bible at random, trying to discern the Lord's will. If anyone challenged his perfectionism, he accused them of being antinomians, who were happy to accept their sinfulness. He dismissed them as almost Christians. Wesley, like many modern charismatics, rejected not just the Protestant reformers, but also the church fathers in favor of heretics. God always reserved a seed for himself, a few that worshipped him in spirit and in truth. I have doubted whether that arch-heretic, Montanus, was not one of the holiest men in the second century. Yea, I would not affirm that the arch-heretic of the fifth century, as plentifully as he has been bespattered for many ages, was not one of the holiest men of that age. I verily believe the real heresy of Pelagius was neither more nor less than this, the holding that Christians may, by the grace of God, not without it, that I take to be a mere slander, go on to perfection, or in other words, fulfill the law of Christ. Wesley is famous for his zealous service and public declarations of love for Jesus. So the idea of a spirit-filled remnant being dismissed as heretics by a dead church is appealing. The problem is that Wesley was not the same man in private that he was in public. In 1766, the same year he published a plain account of Christian perfection, John wrote privately to his brother Charles. In one of my last letters, I was saying that I do not feel the wrath of God abiding on me, nor can I believe it does. And yet, this is the mystery. I do not love God. I never did. Therefore, I never believed in the Christian sense of the word. Therefore, I am only an honest heathen. And yet, to be so employed of God, and so hedged in, that I can neither get forward nor backward. Surely there was never such an instance before from the beginning of the world. If I ever have had that faith, it would not be so strange but I never had any other evidence of the eternal or invisible world than I have now, and that is none at all, unless such as faintly shines from reason's glimmering ray. And yet I dare not preach otherwise than I do, either concerning faith, or love, or justification, or perfection. And yet I find rather an increase than a decrease of zeal, for the whole work of God and every part of it. I am borne along, I know not how, that I can't stand still. I want all the world to come to what I do not know. Wesley was writing this after over 30 years of ministry, in spite of his zeal to take the gospel to the Indians, in spite of his Aldersgate experience where he felt his heart strangely warmed, in spite of all his travels and all his preaching, Wesley was, by his own admission, not a Christian. But he never admitted this publicly. He never considered that what he wanted to dismiss as church tradition was actually the faith once for all delivered to the saints, that the church fathers, Protestant reformers, and men like George Whitfield all disagreed with him because they were rightly reading the scriptures. Instead, he continued to rail against their God as a monster just like Joseph Smith. He pointed countless millions down a road that failed him and continues to fail them. 
Pentecostalism's desperate search for some new work of grace, some new experience that will finally bring us to maturity, is found neither in Scripture nor in John Wesley's own life. It wasn't that Nabil or his wife lacked faith. It was that Pentecostalism and all its unique promises were built on a foundation of sand. Our plea to you is to recognize that Satan's lie in the garden was to reject the clear word of God in favor of feelings and rationalizations. Stop turning inward to your subjective impressions and turn outward to the objective word of God. Stop listening to prophets and apostles who don't have the doctrines of the true ones, no matter how great their miraculous testimonies may be. Stop editing the Bible to make it fit what you think is reasonable. And stop listening to the lies of men like John Wesley. In 1769, Augustus Toplady, the composer of Rock of Ages, published an English translation of the book Absolute Predestination. Wesley forged a condensed version of his own, putting Toplady's name to it and presenting a caricature of what the book actually said. He ended it with this. The sum of all is this. One in twenty of mankind are elected. Nineteen in twenty are reprobated. The elect shall be saved, do what they will. The reprobate will be damned, do what they can. Reader, believe this or be damned. This isn't what Top Lady wrote. This isn't the Reformed doctrine of predestination. But even though he fabricated it, Wesley publicly railed against it because he found it easier to refute a straw man than Top Lady's actual arguments. Our plea is to listen to what your critics are actually saying rather than what others say about them. Then be good Bereans and test it all from the Scriptures. The Spirit speaking by and with the Scriptures is sufficient, and so is the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Stop turning inward to your righteousness and turn outward to His. That is the only real rest you will ever find for your souls. Many charismatics are familiar with the Calvinist John Newton's hymn, Amazing Grace. Newton was a former slave trader who rejoiced in the love that sought him when lost and blind, that justified an enemy of God and made him a beloved child. He rejected not only Wesley's Arminianism, but denounced his perfectionism as subversive to the very foundations of Christianity. We'll leave you with Newton's hymn on sanctification. It presents a piety and a power that stands in stark contrast with Wesley and all his modern successors. It's about the power to deny ourselves, to take up our crosses, and to follow Christ. It's about a grace that not only saves us, but takes us home. I ask the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace, might more of his salvation know, and seek more earnestly his face. T'was he who taught me thus to pray, and he, I trust, has answered prayer, but it has been in such a way as almost drove me to despair. I hope that in some favored hour, at once he'd answer my request, and by his love's constraining power, subdue my sins and give me rest. Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart, and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yea, more with his own hand he seemed intent to aggravate my woe, crossed all the fair designs I schemed, blasted my gourds, and laid me low. Lord, why is this? I trembling cried. Wilt thou pursue thy worm to death? Tis in this way, the Lord replied. I answer prayer for grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set thee free and break thy schemes of earthly joy that thou mayest seek thy all in me. Mm -hmm.